Good evening, everybody. My name is Shane Yule, and I'm a member of the Engineers Ireland West Region Committee. This webinar is part of a series of CPD events organised by Engineers Ireland West Region Committee to align with the strategic outcomes from the recently published Irish National Development Plan. Tonight, we have two excellent speakers, Janet Lynch from Arup and Dara Lynch from Dara Lynch Arctics. We're going to talk about the circular economy and how circular economy principles can be applied to the built environment. Unfortunately, one of our speakers, Dr. Mark Kelly from GMIT, cannot attend the event tonight, but he has sent me four slides, which I will share after our two speakers. The format this evening is that we will have the two presentations first, followed by a Q&A session in which you can ask questions of our two speakers. I would ask that you ask your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and not the chat box. So just a brief introduction in relation to the circular economy. Uh, in recent times, quite rightly, there's been a large focus on the critical role of renewable energy and energy efficient measures to combat climate change. However, if we wish to tackle the climate emergency, we need to transition to a circular approach in order to reduce the 45% of emissions associated with making products. Today's global economy, including the built environment sector, is still overwhelmingly based on the linear take, make, and waste model of production and consumption. Whereas in a circular economy, waste is minimized and products are kept in use for as long as possible through design, repair, and reuse. Before I introduce our first speaker, uh, I want to mention one statistic that I came across from a 2017 UN report, which determined that the built environment uses almost half of the materials extracted globally every year. And based on current projections, that by 2060 across the world, the equivalent of the city of Paris will be built each week. So just food for thought there, that's the equivalent of, equivalent of the city of Paris each week. So with that, I'll introduce our, our first speaker. Uh, Janet Lynch leads the Arab Ireland Circular Economy and Resource Efficiency Team. She has over 20 years experience of resource efficiency in the built environment with Arab in Dublin and London, and also Dublin City Council. She is currently assisting Transport Infrastructure Ireland with the creation of its circular economy plan. Her projects include Crossrail, London 2012 Olympics, Dart Underground, N6 Galway City Ring Road and Bus Connects. She is also the chair for the NSAI Standards Committee on Circular Economy and Construction. And she's going to introduce the principle of circular economy, give an overview of circular economy strategies and describe some of the work Arup are doing in relation to the circular economy. Thanks so much, um, Shane. Um, so thanks so much for the opportunity um, to present this evening. Um, so as part of my presentation, I'm going to give a brief overview of the principles of circular economy um, and then an introduction to Irish and EU policy in relation to circular economy. And then some brief whistle stop tour of a couple of projects um, that are for delivering that are particularly circular. So first of all, the three key principles of circularity can be summarized as follows, designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use at their highest possible value and the regeneration of natural systems. In the built environment or the transportation stays, uh, uh, sectors, um, the nine or as it's described, um, categorization of circularity um, is often um, put forward or used. And that's what's shown on the screen at the moment. So um, the European Investment Bank, for example, the European Union, um, transport agencies across Europe um, take this approach. The most circular approach you can take to delivering your built environment assets is to deliver their function. So in the case of transportation assets in the built environment, for example, you're aiming to deliver mobility with the minimum resource consumption and the minimum impact on the environment. So what might that look like? Up at the top of this diagram or a zero refusing the asset, you could be introducing compact growth that reduces the demand for travel. You could be introducing active travel measures and you could be intensifying the use of public transport. In the center, it looks like effective asset management systems maintaining your assets in use for as long as possible, optimizing, digitizing maintenance schedules, 
and the least circular approach that you can take to your assets is the breaking out of the asset and their incineration to um, obtain energy. Um, another um, uh, a uh, commonly used communication tool in relation to circular business models is shown on the screen. So this is known as the value hill. Along the life of your assets, you're adding value, you're mining materials, you're adding labor, you're building, um, and during construction, you're adding, um, uh, you're uh, using equipment and there's labor involved in that. You want to keep the value of your asset at the top of the asset hill at its highest possible value at all times. So there are four business models um, considered particularly circular and they um, are, are implemented along the life of assets. At circular design stage, you could be looking at design for deconstruction approaches, for example. Um, during the use of assets, you could be using it, looking at optimal use models, such as um, purchasing as a service, sharing of assets between utility providers or between organizations, at the end of life of assets, when you must break them out, value recovery models are used where you're um, optimizing the value of the broken out asset and materials through, for example, material sharing platforms. Circular support models are any financial or any virtual model that support the other three models. So um, in terms of um, built environment projects, a three prong approach can be taken to circular economy. In relation to materials and design strategies, design for deconstruction principles set out in ISO 20887, for example, can be implemented. Offsite construction can be used or modular construction, which reduces waste. Cradle to cradle material and product certification, for example, designing your asset for reuse and recovery and designing for material optimization. The outcomes that you're aiming for are to reduce resource consumption, reduce costs and extend the life of the built environment asset. As a business strategy, we're looking to retain the value of the asset, make those assets flexible, perhaps um, procure using performance criteria, I'll talk about that a little more in a moment, um, uh, build relocatable assets perhaps, and purchase products as a service. The outcomes and the aims are value creation, keeping the assets in use in their highest value and systemic change. In terms of life cycle assessment tools that might be used during environmental product declarations, the whole time you're looking to maximize the value of the asset in terms of social value, environmental value, realize returns, and um, in the economic space, whole life returns on your investment. So it's a three pronged approach proposed to circular economy in relation to built environment assets. That's a material and design strategy, a business strategy, and a life cycle assessment strategy. So what are the benefits of taking the circular economy approach to built assets and to implementing these principles on your projects? Value capture, capturing social, environmental and economic value. Um, if you look at material flow modeling or resource flow modeling, it allows you to identify um, value loss and value capture opportunities, reducing carbon, a, um, aiding our uh, clients and um, your own organizations with um, achieving their net zero carbon goals by 2050 and 2030, reduce consumption of unsustainable resources, supply chain resilience, future proofing supply chains against uh, shocks such as carbon constrained economy, COVID and Brexit. Um, pilot projects and innovation tend to go hand in hand with implementing circular economy and energy efficiency results from mapping energy flows on projects. I'm just going to briefly run through the EU and the Irish policy in relation to circular economy at the, um, for a few moments. So the European Union published its own sustainability strategy um, in 2019, and this was the Green Deal. It clearly set out in the introduction its aims in relation to resources, and it said that 90% of biodiversity loss and 50% of carbon emissions are associated with resource extraction production. It committed the EU to net zero emissions by 2050 and finance for a just transition for all. One of the actions set out in the Green Deal was creating the EU Circular Economy Action Plan, which was published in the spring of 2020. It aimed to make sustainable products the norm in the European Union, empower consumers to a true right to repair. It identified sectors where there was an urgent need to transition to a circular approach and also which had the greatest opportunity for circularity. And the most important one of those in relation to the built environment is construction and buildings. 
in the autumn of um, 2020, the Waste Action Plan for a Circular Economy was published by the Irish government. It set out 200 actions for transition of the waste industry from a linear to a circular approach, take make waste approach to a circular approach. Um, so I suppose it's worth, this is a, 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 a significant document in terms of the number of actions and the ambition, but waste is just one part of the circular economy. Um, and so um, the key takeaways are shifting the focus away from waste disposal to ensure materials and products re remain in productive use for longer, make producers environmentally accountable. It highlighted the need to plan for construction and demolition waste and materials management at the earliest possible stage in projects and measures um, to support sustainable economic models were set out, for example, supporting the use of recycled over virgin materials. The most recent publication from um, the Department of the Environment is the whole of government circular economy strategy. And this shows leadership from the Irish government um, in terms of transition to a circular approach. And it aims for Ireland to achieve over the EU average circularity um, by 2030. And it identifies key sectors for um, circularity roadmaps, um, which are of particular um, relevance to the built environment and construction, transportation and procurement are three of those. Um, so um, one of the, I suppose, most progressive and interesting um, pieces of legislation in the European Un Union in recent years in relation to um, circular economy um, was introduced by the French government in 2020. And I just included it because it's um, of general interest and it looks at um, the idea of repairability and durability. It looks at um, attaching repairability indices to project to products in France a scale of one to 10 for repairability. From 2024, a durability index for their pro uh, products will be introduced. And in built environment contracts, um, this type of approach, repairability, modularity, and durability metrics are a very good way of including circularity um, in your projects when you're looking at procurement. Um, leadership also shown by the European Union in relation to circular economy, and um, that's particularly interesting to the to built environment assets is known as the um, sustainability taxonomy. And um, it sets out criteria by which banks and financial institutions can deem their investments to be sustainable. It has six theme headings that are shown on the left hand side of the slide here. Criteria have been published as guidance for climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. Um, draft criteria were published in August of last year for the other um, uh, topic headings. One of those is transition to a circular economy. So for investments going forward to be considered sustainable, they must meet the criteria set out in this um, uh, package and um, it's known as the sustainability taxonomy. So four of the key sectors in relation to the built environment are set out on the screen for circular economy, buildings, civil engineering, road maintenance and bridges and tunnels. There are over 70 different sectors for which criteria are set out in the taxonomy. The word taxonomy incidentally means um, uh, a definition or um, quite like a dictionary or a lexicon. Um, so um, I should have said that at the start, apologies. So, um, and um, under a circular economy, there are measures relating to reverse logistics, preparation for reuse and recycling, 30% um, recycled, reused or remanufactured content um, is, is present there across the board in building civil engineering, road maintenance and bridges and tunnels. There are other circular strategies such as life cycle assessment in accordance with levels. Levels is the um, European Union's metrics for sustainable and circular buildings and also in relation to data such as dig digital logbooks, digital twins, and monitoring of assets such as bridges. So these criteria um, would need to be taken into account in built environment assets um, to ensure that they can be considered sustainable in terms of investment from financial institutions in the future. And so I'm just going to talk very briefly about circular economy in organizations and companies. Um, there's um, a standard, a British standard 8001, that sets out the principles for circular economy in organizations. And these are transparency, stewardship, innovation, systems thinking, collaboration, and value optimization. 
the standard sets out a means of undertaking maturity assessment and guidance for organisations to support their transition from a linear to a circular approach. Particularly circular organisation in a leading light in relation to circular economy globally is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Are particularly fortunate that we have a partnership since 2016 with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation as their built environment knowledge partners. They provide support to their members. They've got a very active industry and stakeholder network. They undertake evidence based original research and have concentrated its work in areas where shifting to the circular economy can have the biggest impact plastics, food, fashion, finance, and cities. The Arab um, Sustainability Strategy, A Better Way, includes um, circular economy principles within the strategy. And this type of strategic approach embedding of circular economy within organizational strategies supports the transition of organizations from a linear to a circular approach. So there, if should you wish to read further about circular economy and different topics in the built environment, there are a number of um, thought pieces and um, uh, research papers that have been published by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation in conjunction with ARP and a number of other organizations on topics such as blockchain, um, the urban bio loop, um, and realizing the value of circular economy in real estate. Um, so I'm just going to briefly just run through some circular environment, circular economy built environment projects um, that we've been um, working on. So it's a real whistle stop tour. So my contact details are at the end if you um, are interested in getting any further information on these projects. The main project that um, uh, uh, I'm involved in currently is um, the Transport Infrastructure Ireland Circular Economy Action Plan. Um, a working definition of circular economy has been um, established with TII in creation of this plan. It's an economy that's restorative and regenerative by design, which aims to keep assets, components and materials at their highest utility and value at all times. It's the sweating of assets and the re-engineering of business systems. Traditionally, a linear approach has been taken to built environment projects that looks at the planning and design and the construction and implementation of the project. Following construction, a stronger links will be made between the construction phase, the operation and maintenance phases of projects and the upgrade and the decommissioning phases to enable implementation of a whole life um, circular economy approach to projects. Um, so a layers of change approach would be embedded in TII standards. So this is an approach to construction that was um, uh, developed in the building space um, by an architect called Stuart Brandt, who identified um, the buildings that he was designing in the 1990s, that there was different rates of change of the building elements. The facade, for example, had a longer, had a shorter life and the fixtures and fittings had a much shorter life than the building itself, which was being designed for 40 years. So he proposed uh, a less destructive, more circular, sustainable approach to construction, which is the grouping together of similar life duration assets, which are easily um, removable from the structure and um, their minimum amount of um, uh, 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 destruction and breakout is required in that case to detach these elements. A similar approach has been applied um, to the roads cross section where the life duration of each of the assets within the cross section has been identified um, in conjunction with specialists and these, um, this design for deconstruction and adaptability approach will be embedded within TI standards. A similar approach has been taken to um, light rail cross section, the assets within light rail assets. As part of um, development of the TI circular economy plan, the theme headings under which the action plan is being um, developed are shown on the screen. These are asset management, procurement, stakeholder engagement, life cycle assessment, information and materials management, and a cross cutting theme heading of re-engineering um, of systems. Um, there are pilot projects underway. Um, so there's the Art Analytical Pavement Design Tool. That's a performance-based design tool and that enables the reuse of materials um, within pavement projects and um, the use of innovative and new materials. There's a light rail circular economy plan pilot project to embed the principles of circular economy and design for deconstruction and regenerative design within light rail projects and also a route selection phase road circular economy project. And just very briefly, the performance-based 
um, Irish analytical pavement design method that's in development um, takes into account local um, ground conditions and also um, the uh, so it's site specific um, ground conditions and then local or innovative pavement materials deterioration model modeling and traffic loading conditions so this enables the reduction of materials and the repurposing of materials so it's a fundamental change to the design methodology of road pavement um, in Ireland so it's a performance related rather than an empirical approach and um, that um, enables um, a, a, a reduced um, material consumption in some cases. A pilot project was undertaken and along the 11 kilometres of the pilot project, there was 800,000 um, euros of a saving um, was, was modelled. Um, one circular economy and rail project um, that we've been heavily involved in is um, the delivery of the high speed two rail project um, phase one um, of the project. So this is between London and Birmingham. So it's 230 kilometers. So the methodology was designing out waste workshops were undertaken. So significant um, materials and waste savings resulted. Um, so circular economy principles were published for the project that were taken into account by all um, of the supply chain and tenders. Um, as it's being delivered at the moment, um, a 50% CO2 reduction target was placed um, in all contracts. Um, we were given the opportunity for one specific site, um, Calvert Depot in Buckinghamshire, to um, implement design for deconstruction principles. So this was um, a fantastic project. We modelled the materials, energy, water and um, uh, wastes for the site at construction stage. It's a railhead at um, operation stage. It's a rail depot. And the result of um, the design for deconstruction and life cycle assessment approach was an 8% reduction in capital cost, a 10% reduction in virgin material reuse, a reuse and 50% reduction in construction demolition waste. Um, some other projects we've been involved in is the house timber building um, in the Netherlands. So this is um, over uh, 70 metres uh, tall and there's um, 21 floors and um, it uses, it's um, extremely tall for a timber uh, bio-based material building. So um, that was particularly interesting. And then the local project in Tilburg in the Netherlands where there was repurposing of a rail depot, um, a public library. And um, this was a pre-COVID project, the circular economy team in the Netherlands, um, in our Netherlands were involved in and there was a co there was a working um, hub a remote working hub there as well actually which is particularly topical and timely um, given um, the, the pandemic um, happened shortly afterwards so um, some work that um, circular economy work that's um, interesting from Europe Australia is there's a recycled content and rail guide that we created for um, MTIA in the state of Victoria that enabled um, su the supply chain to um, embed um, recycled content within their tenders. And 5% um, uh, of the uh, tender costs went to implementing the measures within the guides. And in the pilot projects, we de delivered um, uh, a pilot project with the use of plastic within sleepers, which was particularly um, uh, successful because it increased the durability of the sleepers. Um, so um, at the moment, um, we're just finalising a, a circular design framework tool with the Alan MacArthur Foundation that we're just launching um, next month. Um, so um, it's to enable um, embedding of circular economy principles in built environment projects. And the nine uh, principles are shown on the screen. So it's a practical toolkit for implementing circular economy in your projects. And um, so it enables the, it sets out the principles, strategies and actions you can take within the building design uh, process. So our engineers globally have had fantastic time over um, recent months developing the actions from our projects to embed within the toolkit and to share. So um, that's a, um, a watch it for um, uh, the beginning of March, we're going to be launching that. Um, so thanks so much for your time and attention. Um, if you've any further queries on the project, they're quite short descriptions there. Please don't hesitate um, just to, 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 to reach out and contact me and I can give you further details on this. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. That was an excellent presentation. A great overview of 
uh, I suppose, policy coming from Europe and Ireland and uh, some great examples from around the world that uh, are involved in. Uh, and now I'm going to introduce our second speaker, uh, Dara Lynch, graduated from UCD almost 30 years ago. Since then, he has worked in London and India. And after 10 happy years in Ballymun regeneration, he started his own design practice in Malahide in 2013. He is focused on making high quality designs that are tailored to the client's needs. He has a wide range of experience that includes housing, community development, and low energy design. He's a member and former chair of the RAI Sustainability Task Force and regularly speaks on sustainability and the circular economy. He is primarily going to discuss the implementation of circular economy strategies on the Rediscovery Centre in Ballymun. Thanks, Shane. Um, so again, just to, before I start, just to put uh, so, some of this stuff in context, and this uh, hopefully is going to be boring for most of you, but uh, we currently as a planet emit 51 billion tonnes of carbon into the atmosphere. And by 2050, we have to get that to zero. Um, I, th I think that probably represents the biggest threat to humanity, uh, including world wars and ice ages. Uh, so, I mean, if, if you want to picture that, there's about two, uh, two tons of, of uh, carbon equivalent in a hot air balloon, if you can, if you, I, I, I think the hot air balloon is a good visualization for what two tons of gas looks like. Um, and as a, as a planet where we're, um, they're the, the top 10 culprits, uh, China being, being the worst in the USA in a second, but uh, um, that isn't to say that the, the, foot, the, the footprint per person isn't, isn't different. So Ireland are quite, whether meaningless in terms of the overall global output, we're quite high per capita. So in terms of your, your um, overall carbon footprint uh, as individuals, um, uh, our homes are about responsible for 25% of, of our carbon. Our food and travel account for another 50% and stuff is another 50%. But uh, that, that's, that, that's our individual footprint. So in terms of how we use our buildings and so, as, uh, so on as individuals, we, we can make uh, an impact into the, the, the global footprint of, of our, our families and our, our cities and our country and, and the globe. But as professionals dealing in the um, construction industry, uh, we're responsible for uh, almost 40% of global carbon footprint. So uh, I think we are all in a privileged position in the construction industry and, and indeed in other transport pro projects and so on that Janet was talking about, to, to make a massive impact in, in way beyond our individual uh, capacity to, to make an impact in our work. Uh, we're privileged to be able to make a real impact in, in the total global uh, situation. And in terms of uh, cir circularity, I think there's three things that we need to keep in mind. Um, one is the materials, and that's uh, what we use. Um, the, the big challenge there, I think, is in concrete and steel. Both of those materials include massive uh, carbon tariff in terms of, of the sheer chemistry of making those materials. Um, and also, there's a huge energy uh, um, quota associated with them as well. Um, Measurement of the carbon, I think, is something that we need to get to grips with very quickly um, and, and knowing how much impact we're making is, is critical. And then uh, circularity is much more to do with how we're using the materials. And the critical thing, which Janet mentioned in her talk, was retaining the value of those materials as, as much as possible. Um, I guess the other thing just to mention in the, in the materials uh, that we use, there are, are some materials that are from the biosphere, and that means they're natural, they decompose and harmlessly go back into nature again. So think of leaves falling off a tree or um, you know, natural rubber or, or something like that decomposing. It poses no threat 
to nature. Nature's used to uh, handling these, these materials. The technosphere are to do with materials that are man-made, like metals and, and concrete and so on. Um, so uh, the, the trick is to keep the technosphere um, materials circulating. Uh, so if you use copper, be able to reuse that copper over and over again. If you use steel, be able to reuse that steel over and over again. Um, so the, the other thing worth keeping in mind is the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Um, so there's 17 of, of those. Uh, I'm not sure if people are familiar with those, um, but they brought, were brought to bear in the project that I'm going to talk about now. To do, it's, it's in Ballymun. Uh, there's a, a flyby history of Ballymun. So in the 70s, it was 5,000 families moved out to Ballymun. And um, in the 80s, uh, urban blight set in, uh, drugs came along, huge social problems arrived. Anyone with a job tended to move out of Ballymun, and people with massive social problems moved in. Um, and in the 90s, uh, the blocks were, were demolished and uh, we uh, spent a lot of time building uh, new housing and I'd like to think they're pretty good examples of social housing and um, replacing the flats. Uh, and I guess that's the most uncircular thing you can do. This is what Ballymun looked like in 97. You can see the 14 storey towers um, in, a, in a circle around the central um, uh, roundabout. This cut, this dual carriageway cut the town of Ballymun in, in two. Um, uh, and BRL was, was set up to, um, as a rehousing project to, to deal with the regeneration of the physical, social, and economic sites of, of Ballymun. And um, this image isn't very clear, but you can see now we, we don't have a dual carriageway going down the middle of the, of, of the town. We have a town centre, got rid of the 14 storey blocks, and we have much more kind of uh, low rise, high density housing. Uh, with uh, 1,500 new homes and four new neighbourhood centres, town centre and IKEA, lots of other things. In the middle of all that is a boiler house. I'm sure most of you, are, some of you might, might be familiar with this landmark. It's a big, tall chimney in the middle of Ballymun. <clears throat> uh, it was the district heating centre for uh, everything in Ballymun. There was one road crossing. It was particularly difficult to, to manage DCC, turned DCC off district heating systems for good, I think. Uh, but out of this building, they supplied all the hot and cold water and the space heating needs for all of the flats in Bonnie Mun. Uh, new boilers were installed in 1996 and they were decommissioned in 2011. Um, in parallel with this, the Rediscovery Centre uh, came into uh, to, to being and its, its remit was to change behaviour in waste and resource management and to encourage the circular economy. Um, and uh, it has four social enterprises which are up and running, Rediscover Fashion, uh, Upcycles uh, Clothes, uh, Rediscover Furniture, Upcycles Furniture, um, there's Rediscover Cycling, and there's Rediscover Paint, which recycles paint. Um, so all of these uh, social enterprises needed a place to stay. So uh, it was decided to try to not demolish the boiler house as was originally intended and to reuse the building as a new centre for the rediscovery centre. So it would have one, one location for all of their different activities, which includes the social enterprise, but also includes education and awareness programmes and also research. Um, so the, we started the WISER project um, and that's the kind of timeline for, for the project there. So I was uh, involved in this in, when I worked in Ballymun um, uh, in 2012. And what we tried to do in the design was to demonstrate as many closed loops as possible. So if we had um, a drainage system, we showed how the water was used, how it was treated and how it was uh, you know, made, made safe and used again. Uh, we did the same thing with a, a reed bed uh, to show how solid waste was could be composted and the water treated. Um, and we tried to show how the building materials were used uh, as directly as possible. Um, 
So uh, this was a wiser, uh, sorry, a, a life funded pro program from, from the EU. So the money for demolition was used as the 50% seed capital from the local authority and the rest of the money came from uh, the EU life program. Uh, originally, um, they refused the application, but uh, they decided to um, uh, grant the funding when they uh, reframed the project as the building being a, a, a 3D textbook. So um, we were reusing every element of the building as an educational opportunity. So uh, the plan was to uh, reuse the, the building and the reservoir to uh, try to start a material reuse program to generate 80% of the energy on site and um, to treat, treat the, water, the wastewater on site. And like I said, at the 3D textbooks, all, all aspects of the building were to be demonstrated. So this was the kind of model that we started with. We had a steel uh, frame building that was designed to lose heat. Uh, we had a cold water reservoir at, at the back with a pump house. We had an ESB substation, which actually wasn't part of our site, but there was a substantial ESB substation in, inside the building. Um, and the, at, in the north of the building here was uh, uh, offices and, and, and so on. And obviously the, the chimney. So what we turned it into was a highly efficient public building um, where we were able to reuse the, uh, the reservoir. We were able to make a connection between the reservoir and the first floor of the building. We introduced some new roof lights on the roof of the building and we clad the building um, in a highly insulated uh, timber frame. Uh, so um, we had a material reuse strategy on the building. So the first thing we did was to reuse the existing materials on site. So we were able to harvest steel pipes from the, um, the, the boiler house. And we also um, reused louver fins from the outside. The, the next um, port of call was reuse local materials on site. There was quite a considerable amount of demolition um, happening at Ballymun at the time. And we, we were able to harvest some material from these sites, but we were very limited because of the site, the, the space available to us to store um, material. So we, we could have actually um, harvested a lot more material had we more space. Uh, when we'd exhausted that stream of resource, the next thing was to use uh, sustainable material. So we used hempcrete, which is a mixture of, of hemp, lime and, and cement. Uh, we used some wood wool and we reused some timber frame. And after that, we used local materials. And when we couldn't satisfy any of our material needs that way, we, we um, resorted to other materials. So the, the biggest impact we made um, overall was retaining the frame. And, and that sounds uh, pretty simple and straightforward. Um, but actually, I, I think it's an element of circularity that's completely overlooked. And there's very many buildings where the retention of the structure, which has been designed for 150 years or 200 years, uh, it just gets thrown in the bin um, you know, after a much, much shorter time frame. So we were able to reuse the frame, add some additional cross bracing to increase the bearing capacity of the frame. Um, and we were able to uh, reuse one of the boilers. So again, a, a classic example of, of how uncircular these things could be. So the new boilers were installed in 1996. They were decommissioned in 2011. Uh, DCC at that stage uh, were offered, um, you know, six figure sums for, for the boilers. Um, and they weren't sure whether they wanted to reuse them or not. So they didn't sell them. Uh, and by the time we came around to do the work on them, they were worth nothing and no one was interested in buying them. Uh, and they were, uh, in fact, a liability because they were massively heavy and very difficult to move. Um, the steel pipes, there was acres and sorry, miles and miles of these inside the boiler house. But unfortunately, we weren't able to use them, uh, any of them for structural reasons because of certification. Uh, so it, it is important to try to retain the, uh, the certification on, on things so that you can, you can reuse them. Um, the, so the next um, 
thing we did with the building was we wrapped it with um, a timber frame, which we infilled with hempcrete. Uh, on the north face where there was that masonry brick finish, we uh, used wood wool um, or wood fiber external wall insulation to insulate the building. And um, we installed new uh, roof lights on the roof. Uh, interestingly, there were lots of sustainable options for wall insulation, uh, but there was very few sustainable solutions for foundation insulation or for roof insulation. And um, most of the, the insulation that we use in the roof and walls are made from petrochemicals and again, have a very high carbon tariff. And um, so there, there is a, a market, I think, out there for trying to find a lower carbon um, ins insulators for, the, for wet situations. And um, so you can see here examples of the, the hempcrete is a wonderful finish. Um, it's uh, it's mixed. It, the mixture isn't like a slurry like concrete. It's mixed like kind of apple crumble. Uh, you uh, cast it in within formwork in layers. Um, and what we did was to expose the, the the hempcrete. We just plastered with lime plaster on the inside, up up to a certain height. So the, the at the higher level where you you couldn't kind of touch it or damage it. Uh, you kind of exposed um, the, the, uh, the material. It's a wonderful material because it has structural uh, properties and insulation properties and sustainable credentials all in the one go. But you do need to, um, to know how to use it and be careful in its application. Um, you can see here the surfaces were all exposed, uh, which means that it's very easy to change them around to switch them or to access them. They're not buried anywhere. Um, and what we try to do is just express those as, as clearly as, as possible. Um, on the cladding of the building, you it was quite easy to use recycled brickwork. Uh, there was plenty of that uh, around from the conservation business. And there's a kind of a market set up for reusing brickwork. Uh, these are the aluminium louvers that we harvested from the the, um, the grills, the, to, to shed the heat from the original boiler house. We saved the, the aluminium louvers um, and cut them almost into slates and, and, and clad a section of the building in them. The rest of the cladding is, is timber um, and there is a section of green wall, again, to demonstrate uh, the, the capacity for, for uh, using nature as part of your building. And um, we just had plywood on the on the floor, but um, uh, we made sure that we screwed the plywood. Um, and that, that means that it's, of, it's obviously easier to, to uh, remove the sheets. Uh, you can easily see where they're fixed. You can unscrew them and screw them back down again. And it also retains the value of that sheet of plywood as much as possible. So it makes it easier to maintain and access the building but also try, tries to retain the value of, of the material. Um, anything that you tend to glue or bond or stick um, tends to get broken when you try to take it off. And then it just, it's reduced to its absolute lowest level of, of value. Um, so this is what the building looks like um, at the end of the day. Um, there's some innovative, innovative uh, aspects of the, the water treatment, uh, like these uh, comfrey plants here, are growing in a, a diluted urine system. So we, we collect urine from a urinal in the toilets, we dilute it, and we feed it to the plants. So urine is very high in P, K, and N, which is phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen. All of those things are um, uh, ingredients in fertilizer. So these plants actually digest the, all, all of that stuff. Um, the comfrey then we use as green compost uh, in the vegetable garden that's on the roof of the reservoir. And so people can see the nutrients um, being recycled in a closed loop and we can, we can demonstrate that. Uh, there's also a biodiversity pond here which uh, is used uh, to do experiments with school kids about trying to find um, insects and understand how they live in the water. 
um, and that's part of the rainwater recycling uh, system. And we also have a reed bed which treats the uh, foul water. So um, I'll just move on to the next project we're working on, um, which is associated with the boiler house. Um, and we're just at sketch design stage uh, on, on this project, but it, it's useful just to uh, hopefully uh, show you um, how we're trying to build in these ideas of demonstrating circularity in a public park. So our site is a, a, a vacant site in front of the boiler house in Ballymun. A developer had an option to buy this site and uh, wasn't developing it and wasn't moving ahead with its development. So the Rediscovery Centre are in the process of, of trying to get control of this site from Dublin City Council. And we've been asked to come up with a, a plan for a park that will use the site and in the process demonstrate the, the circular economy. So you can see here, this is the, the boiler house. This is the chimney here and the reservoirs at the back with the vegetable garden on the front. And this is the, <coughs> the reed bed and uh, our, our car park and so on. So um, we uh, did a run through the values of the, we did a number of workshops with the, with the staff in the Rediscovery Centre. We examined our values. We looked at the sustainability goals. We broke those down into um, different kind of sections. And we tried to understand where the Rediscovery Centre sat in, in that. So the core thing was, the awareness in the middle and, and the application of that awareness on society, environment and, and production. And really what we were trying to get a visitor to the park to understand is how they're connected to it or affected by it. Uh, and, and the basic question is, how does all of this stuff affect me? So in all of the things we're trying to demonstrate, we're trying to answer that question for the visitors of the park. So then we did a, another workshop where we brainstormed on, on different things that we could do in the park to um, demonstrate uh, circularity and uh, the sustainability goals in action. And we synthesized those into seven kinds of spaces. Um, one, one space uh, is, is an event space for activities for people to gather. Um, the information space we saw mainly as kind of um, wall space or space that you could project information on and um, that would be surrounding you. So um, as you're passing through the park, you're almost uh, learning by, by accident. There's a public place just for people to sit, play and chat. And, um, you know, it's a it's great. There is a, a, a kind of a central plaza in Ballymun, but uh, it's kind of a rare opportunity to be able to make a space like that in a town, town like Ballymun. So um, th that's kind of ge general kind of spaces. And then the next four are, are dealing particularly with a uh, growing space, which is to do with stuff on the land, water spaces to do with water, obviously, uh, energy and waste. They were the four kind of um, areas of dem demonstration. So we came up with a, a phased development of the site. Um, ranging from very easy, cheap and simple at the start and building up to a larger, more complex development of the site. So the first thing we we're planning to do is to get control of the site, to clear, clear it, uh, clean it of rubbish and plant trees. Uh, and these would be demonstrating native uh, trees in, in Ireland and, and those trees obviously would be planted first so that they would establish themselves as quickly and for as long as possible. And for the rest of the space, we we're just going to plant a wildflower meadow that people can enjoy. And obviously we'd make a path to the entrance of the um, Rediscovery Centre. So that's phase one. That's very simple. Um, phase two would be start to try to make this um, event space. So um, there, uh, we made a very simple uh, pop-up shops and cubicles to hold um, markets, temporary events, exhibitions, and gatherings. Uh, and that's uh, just a very sim simple structures. <clears throat> the next piece is to develop um, an energy playground. So this would be a playground that kids could come and play in. 
But the idea here is as they're cycling the bike or as they're doing their activities, they're also learning about, you know, how much a kilowatt of energy is or, you know, how much work you have to do to replace a kilo of carbon. And um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a playing and, and doing and learning all the same time. We, we have, a, beside the, um, the entrance to the Rediscovery Centre, we had a waste space, which is a place where you can uh, leave material. So if you dump all your waste in, into one bag, it's useless. Uh, people have to sort it and separate it out. But again, if you can separate um, all the cans or the metals or the plastic boxes, plastic bottles and so on, they, they become a resource. So they're not contaminated by anything else. So the idea here is that you have a kind of a, 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 a bring center where people can uh, recycle and uh, their, their waste. Uh, we have a vertical garden here to demonstrate all the growing ideas. So we'd be cultivating uh, plants, herbs and, and vegetables and teaching people um, to, to do that. And uh, above the, the, uh, the waste centre, we were going to have some windmills to demonstrate uh, wind energy. And then finally, uh, we would uh, dismantle the pop-up uh, um, pop shops in, in phase two and reuse that material to make a larger multifunction building with um, offices and labs and the event space and exhibition space. So what that looks like is, uh, you know, this is phase one where we just secure the site, we clean it of the rubbish uh, and we plant it. Um, in phase two, we have uh, pop-up shops and event spaces. In phase three, we have the energy garden, uh, the energy playground and the, the vertical garden. And in phase four, we end up with a taller building and um, where we have our event space on the ground floor. We have our offices and extension facilities for the Rediscovery Center on the first floor, and we have labs and other rentable space on, on, the, on the top floor. So I have a little animation here, I hope works. So uh, just to give you a feel for that in 3D. So that's phase one. Here comes phase two with the pop-up shops. Uh, Phase three then has the energy playground, the waste center, the vertical garden. And finally, we have the uh, building at the, at the end of it. So uh, it's an idea of, of how you can use a kind of framework for the site to expand and develop the site over time, but also demonstrate the reuse of, of the elements on site. Um, so uh, some of the ideas we have around the materials are to have a very clear, direct way of putting together structural elements out of standard uh, piece of timber. And when you unscrew these elements, they simply become usable pieces of timber again um, and can easily be reused somewhere else in the building. Again, it's key to have the certification and uh, parameters and spec of all the, these materials kind of captured somewhere so, so it will facilitate reuse. And then in terms of cladding the building on the outside, uh, we would look at trying to reuse uh, a stream of resources that would be regarded as waste or uh, something that um, isn't uh, really regarded as, as uh, something which you can use as, as building materials, but uh, can easily be used as, as building materials. So, um, so that's that's it for me, Shane. Um, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Dara. A great presentation. I think one of, one of the strongest aspects of the Rediscovery Centre, I suppose, is the educational aspect whereby school children can go and visit and, I suppose, see firsthand circular economy principles in, in uh, working um, and, and touch it and the, even just the, the plants and, and seeing how the the wastewater is reused and so forth. Um, so before I go on to the Q&A session, and again, just to mention that the, if you want to answer, enter questions, it's through the Q&A box. I'm just gonna share uh, four slides that um, Dr. Mark Kelly from GMIT asked me to share. I said, unfortunately he can't uh, attend here today. So I'm just gonna share my screen.
hopefully you can see that there. Um, and just he asked me to draw your attention to a, a useful resource that was published by the Environmental Protection Agency last year, uh, Best Practice Guidelines, and this provides guidelines for the prevention and management of construction and demolition waste from design through to construction and uh, deconstruction. So that's something that you might uh, have a look at uh, if you're looking at implementing um, circular economy principles on a project that you're working on or considering to working on. Second thing then is just uh, in terms of education, just to make you aware that there's a postgraduate program in GMIT run by Mark Kelly in relation to the circular economy. And that has uh, HCI funding, which means that up to 90% of the program fees are covered. Um, the Circular Economy Postgraduate Programme in GMIT is one of a number of programmes offered by uh, higher education institutes in Ireland as part of the DASB project, which offers a range of programmes in energy efficiency, circular economy and uh, digitalisation. So if you want um, more information in relation to either the Circular Economy Programme or the DASBY program, program, the contact details there are on screen. Okay, so I'll just uh, stop sharing.